Uh, welcome to Forging the Cyberfeminist Multi-Reality here at VR for Change. I'm the panel's moderator, Cecilia D'Anastasio. Um, I'm a senior reporter with Kotaku. We're here to talk about aspirations for a future that all of our talented and accomplished panelists here are forging in engines like Unity, in research labs, and in boardrooms. And that future is not one where everybody and their grandmother is donning an Oculus, forever plugged into some escapist multiverse. It's a future where social engagement, and specifically around feminist issues, is the norm. And it's a future that, in ways we'll discuss, virtual reality might help empower. We'll also discuss potential obstacles to this vision, like anonymous harassment in social VR, the wealth of male gazy VR experiences, and the problem of selling a commodity with the promise of social change. Each panelist here is working in the field of VR and their feminist contributions to the field may be overt in the form of eye-opening content inspired by issues women face or covert by simply existing and thriving in such a male-dominated environment. So without further delay, I'm excited to introduce Sophia Dominguez, the CEO and co-founder of SVRF. Surf. Surf. <laughs> The first search and discovery engine for VR content, she also founded All Things VR, a weekly newsletter that highlights virtual reality news and content. Previously, Sophia was the entrepreneur in residence at Rothenberg Ventures and was also the first person to travel the world with Google Glass and document how people reacted to seeing and experiencing it for the first time. <laughs> That's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Clorama de Villas a fellow both as a UX researcher at Code for America and a VR creator at Oculus Launchpad. Clorama discovered VR in the summer of 2015 while researching technology to develop empathy to combat social bias for her MA thesis in London. She realized VR's potential to shape cognitive behavior and self-taught with Unity 3D to develop prototype demos for the Oculus DK2. Since 2016, she's been balancing her love for VR and UX for social impact by freelancing in VR development. Alice Lay George, a principal at Robbins and Robbins and Elman, RRE Ventures in New York, who helps the firm explore emerging technologies such as the blockchain, machine learning, and computer vision, robotics, VR, and AR, and new space. She led the firm's investments in the Wave VR and 8i, where she is a board observer. Alice was previously a Brookings Institute fellow worked in investments at Bridgewater Associates, and began her career at the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong. Zahar Kfir, a New York-based media artist working in experimental video, interactive art and VR. This year, she released Testimony, an interactive documentary for virtual reality that shares the stories of five survivors of sexual assault and their journey to healing. Her artistic practice employs nonlinear narratives and traditional cinematic techniques, and features expanded interactivity. Fear has shown her work internationally in galleries, festivals, and conferences, and has been reviewed in major publications. So I'll get started. I promise no more reading of anything. <laughs> um, and I invite the panelists to jump in and respond to each other if something strikes you, if you had a similar experience to another person, or a drastically contrasting experience. Um, great. Let's start with Clarama. That's OK. Cool. Yeah. Um, you have a phenomenal resume in civic engagement um, and have described yourself as a humanitarian. So I'm curious, what drew you to the field of VR, which is often marketed as entertainment? Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, when I was undertaking my uh, master's in interaction design, I thought it was I had started doing a career transition from um, doing civic, civic engagement work, working in the public sector, to like realizing, okay, there's like this gap of making an impact in um, in uh, civic engagement or in the so, uh, in the public sector um, field. Um, with that I thought technology could help fill, but it was being underutilized. So I decided to transition into tech. I started learning to code and um, looked at a master's in interaction design that I thought was gonna be like how to make better websites because I felt like websites um, or building communities online can help to build communities in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, to help uh, increase activism or engagement in general. Um, so I actually took that master's by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like how to make better websites, but it was all like super physical computing, how to experiment with new technologies <laughs> to solve world problems, which is like a really great mistake. Yeah. Um, so, um, but interestingly enough, so I had done this in London and uh, I was only the only woman of color 
and uh, in my course, and I noticed I was getting um, receiving microaggressions from one of our from our technical assistants uh, for the class, and they were constantly saying things to me that were almost as if like made me feel like I wasn't really there. I didn't really get in there for merit. I was there just for numbers. Um, and we're constantly like, it just, I felt like I was being underestimated on a regular basis. And, and, and sometimes the comments that they would make were super overt, like, it's gonna be too complicated for you, blah, 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 blah. Like, and, and I would get ignored. And I was like, what is happening? Like, I was like <laughs> having like this mental crisis. Like, I was like, am I tripping? Like, like, I'm never, I'm known to be an overachiever, especially being from Silicon Valley. Like, that's uh -huh. just in my blood to like, um, like, okay, we have a problem, let's solve it. So um, when I was getting that type of response, I was like, kind of trying to figure out what it was. Our thesis was solve a world problem using technology. It was that broad. Wow. And I was like, okay, well, this is clearly a problem that I, I'm experiencing. I started researching it, and I learned, I discovered the terms implicit bias, unconscious bias, um, microaggressions. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's like speaking to me uh -huh. um, in terms of what I was going through doing my, my master's. Um, uh, so um, I was looking for like, okay, well, what's the solution to that? And I saw that there was a lot of articles written around empathy. This is 2015, so I think Ellen Powell's case in Silicon Valley just started getting big. Um, so the, a lot of those words were starting to get thrown around. Uh, I was all the way in London um, and reading those articles and when I was doing this initial research. Um, and I was like, okay, I think this could be solved if my, and I was just thinking of like my, um, the techno assistants for our course and the, the assistants to our professors, if they could empathize with me like, and not see me as other, but mm -hmm. see me as the rest, like, like the rest of the peers and see something in me that they can resonate with, that they can believe in my potential and my capability um, instead of writing me off immediately based on visible uh, appearances, which became apparent was the case. Um, then maybe I can um, begin to address it. So I was looking at technology that could uh, help to develop empathy, uh, landed on a TED Talks, uh, it was Chris Milk's TED Talk on VR and empathy, um, which had just been released like a month before that. Um, and I was like, oh, this is it, virtual reality. <laughs> I was like, and I, we happened to have, in, uh, our, our thesis course had like a, uh, at a DK2, sitting mm -hmm. there collecting dust. Nobody had touched it. Um, nobody wanted to, like, it was just kind of a thing. I was like, I'm just going to try it and see how far I can get. Um, but I feel like this is a potential technological tool or a piece of technology that can help develop empathy. I want to explore how we can use empathy strategically to target. I've never actually experienced a VR. It, you had never had a VR experience that would lead you to believe personally and viscerally that VR could inspire empathy? I started exploring and prototyping and building for it, learning how to build for it without having ever tried VR before. Wow. Um, yeah, just because I believed <laughs> I think the idea of being immersed in it and being embodiment, and uh -huh. there was some research, University of Barcelona had done some research in um, using VR um, suits um, where people can see themselves. It was, I think it was a group of like 30 white women in Barcelona. Uh, I think that was some of them part of the studies. Um, took the implicit bias test on, uh, from, that Harvard created, um, and then put on the bodysuit and then saw themselves as a black woman in the space, yeah. um, saw people of different other races passing by them in this VR space, then took off, like it was like about five minutes, then went and did the implicit bias test and they saw a significant drop in um, the biases that, um, that they, mm -hmm. I guess, had shown. Yeah, so, I've, seen, yeah. I've seen a lot of studies like that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious whether anybody else on the panel had a specific experience uh, or even read a study that led them to believe that VR could be a good medium to help inspire empathy for women uh, or issues women face. Uh, I mean, for me, with creating testimony, I mean, the main reason that I wanted to create this project in VR was, was a, I see VR as like a commitment, so you put the headset on and you're committed to watching the the materials, so uh, for me it was a way to confront people with testimonies of sexual assault survivors, so people are like locked into the situation and can really like listen face to face. I mean, they can take as much as they want from the experience, but even if they watch like two minutes from someone's experience and gain this empathy, so I mean. So what I'm gathering sorry. from you is that, like Clorama, this was something that you wanted to build for yourself, but that you hadn't necessarily seen in the world yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was basically a custom-made uh, application that I wanted to design for storytelling for this topic. Yeah. Um, did you have an intended audience in mind when you were trying to enact this vision? Uh, well, I mean, it's made for 
Or actually, why don't you describe testimony yeah. <laughs> a little bit before we talk about its audience? Uh, okay, so testimony uh, is an interactive web documentary. Uh, the first iteration is in Gear VR, and we're developing a web VR platform that will launch in September. The Gear VR version shares um, testimonies of five sexual assault survivors, four women and one men, and it's constructed in an interactive fashion so people can choose their own subject. And in a way, I didn't want to lock anyone into a linear experience, so you can choose what you want to watch and have a moment to breathe if uh, something is becoming too emotional or uh, sensitive. Uh, and the project premiered at Tribeca and um, gained a lot of attention and we're planning to uh, start a tour in September in campuses uh, to use it as an educational tool. And the web platform will um, have an option for people to upload their own testimonies, whether they're video, audio, and text. Uh, so it will be as a web VR experience and also as a desktop experience. So what I'm curious about is that um, I, I tried testimony last week and it was, it was wonderful. It was really powerful. I was curious because you're talking about the fact that you can't look away when you're experiencing this in VR, but you're also talking about the breaks that you can take between hearing women's, um, hearing about these women's mm -hmm. traumas. Can you explain why you think VR was the optimal medium to hear about survivors' experiences with assault? Uh, so my main thought when conceiving the project was that with VR, I mean, putting the headset on is a commitment uh, to watch something. And I don't think anyone would like pop a Netflix uh, queue and watch like a sexual assault documentary on the weekend. Uh, <laughs> but so yeah, I mean, once you're committed to experience, you'll watch some of it. Uh, but structuring it as an interactive way, I didn't want to do it in 360 because people are still locked to a linear experience. So each person is asked five questions. So there's like little, you can imagine like fragments floating around you. And with the gaze control, it's a very simple and intuitive navigation. So as you gaze at someone, they come closer to you. And when you move your head away, they will float backwards. Uh, so it's a very intuitive way to listen. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's like a listening mechanism for VR. So you're saying that this, the actual putting on this hardware is the commitment. Something I'm curious about, and I'd, and I'd like to ask Alice this actually, is that um, it's hard to get people to put on the hardware when they don't have access to it. And, and you've made it your job to um, talk, about, uh, talk in optimistic terms about the mainstream adoption of VR. I'm curious, how do you... How would you pitch VR to somebody who's never tried it? And how would you especially pitch VR experiences that are um, helping people understand women's issues? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely tough when you, when you look at the numbers, and especially there have been studies of women in, in particular. And I think Ernst & Young put out one that they surveyed women and said, would you be willing or interested in trying VR? And 65% said, no I saw way. that study too. No way. They don't even want to try it. So like, I think that's the first barrier is being open-minded. Um, I think there's this conception that it's sort of, um, oh, it's geeky, it's for, it's for guys. And so I'm not a geek. I don't want to strap something to my face there. As Sophia says, I don't want to get sweaty and be stuck in it. <laughs> um, but you know, what they've also found is that if there's a specific use case, women tend to be more interested. So I think where they've tested, would you be willing to do sort of VR for something like fitness? Fitness, yeah. Right. Then, then, then women are more willing to try it when there's something specific and it's not, um, it's not sort of aimless. But no, I think it, it's you know the headset numbers distribution is still you know in the low millions, and so we've got to work up. And and as it's this sort of flywheel of the more head, headsets you have, the more content you have, the more headsets you have, and so it's where do you trigger that chicken and egg. And so mm -hmm. from the investment perspective, you know, we need great content out there. Um, and so that's, that's a large part of, I think, getting the flywheel going and, and having great women creating is, is a big part of it because I don't want to just try first person shooters. I love games, but first person shooters are not for me and I definitely don't want to do them in VR. I, I have a very low threshold for horror <laughs> and I don't want to like call out specific experiences that I've done in VR, but okay, I did do one where like I'm terrified of dinosaurs ever since Jurassic Park, <laughs> and um, 
<laughs> you're like trapped on an island with, with velociraptors and T-Rexes attacking you and you basically just have a hatchet, or I was bad at switching the weapons, and so I like, couldn't find the machine gun in time, and like the velociraptors are attacking you, and I'm like, okay, there, there may be women that love that, but for me... I'm one of them. Yeah, I'm <laughs> okay. so I I'm probably everyone else shooters. Think, like, it's just my fear of velociraptors. It hasn't gone away. But, um, but you know, it's like, and, and everyone had good intentions in creating these things, but you know, another example from that, and I'm just rambling, but you have two choices of a body at the beginning, man or woman. So I was like, okay, I'll switch, I'll switch on the you know, woman's body and load up on my weapons. And I looked down and I had like this massive cleavage. <laughs> and um, I was like, whoa, you know, I'm like pretty petite. Because it's and not, so a lot of the time, especially in MMOs like World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV, mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's, it's people who identify as male who are playing uh, female bodied mm -hmm. avatars mm -hmm. because they, you know, they, they figure like, oh, if I'm going to be looking at someone's butt the whole time, yeah, I'd rather be, well look, I'd rather be a well woman. Be sexy, right. So yeah. I don't know. I was like, well, I'm a woman looking at a different woman's body. If I was a man, how would I, I'd be staring at my cleavage the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so kind of long winded, you know, answer to your question. But um, yeah, no, I think that getting women in now is so important. One of the things that we were talking about before the panel started was that um, there were several kind of uh, VR experiences intended to generate empathy for women's issues that are not yet listed um, on any sort of Oculus website, not on Steam. You can't download them. Um, there's one about um, the experience of getting catcalled. There's one about the experience of getting date raped. And I'm curious, how are you um, working to help uh, make these VR experiences not only accessible but appealing? Yeah, so stemming off of what you guys were talking about before, so Surf is a search engine for immersive content, and um, I come from, I founded All Things VR, which is one of the longest running virtual reality newsletters. Um, and so the appeal of All Things VR was we're trying to break down or educate people about um, the virtual reality and augmented reality industry and appeal to people who aren't already in the industry and give them further insight into like what's happening, what's important, and through this process of running the newsletter for about a year, started to realize that like finding content was really, really difficult and really, really strenuous in people. Like I was getting burnt out from the process because there's a content section. And so we were like, okay, there's something here. We can make it easier for people to find good content. Like what is the definition of good content? Um, so we started building Surf. And like the whole thesis behind that is that one of the biggest problems is that a lot of people don't have headsets. Mm -hmm. And so we were like making it accessible and so everything that you can view, you can view it on the web. Um, and we, have also have, we also have a Chrome extension and then also an Android app. Um, and the idea is that like we can scale as industry scales and kind of get more people access to this stuff to make it more approachable. So like I actually didn't know about those female um, content pieces. I mean, maybe it's in the database. I, I will check. <laughs> um, but I'd, like I would love for people to email us like, hey, uh, like uh, this just this just came out. Can you index it or something like that for us to be aware? And like we can make collections about this thing and kind of bring um, like more visibility to the, these experiences and, and make that a huge part of what our platform is to make it more accessible so that people, when they do get a headset, they're like, oh, I know exactly how to find content. So I'm curious to what extent you'll be doing any curation, because there are several VR experiences that one might describe as kind of antagonistic to mm -hmm. feminist goals. Um, there are a lot of games and experiences that are being put out you know, in Japan, like Summer Lesson. There's right. this like young woman fawning over you, her teacher, you know, and it's, it's very kind of male gazy. There's a lot of um, problematic VR porn. Is this, are you going to be listing these things as well? Um, so we don't do games, that's just the one area, just because like Steam and Oculus are definitely optimized for that, whereas we are not. But that's something that we've th I actively talked about. Um, we're not promoting any of that stuff right now. Like that actually gets a bad rating. Um, a lot of the cate categorizers are actually uh, women. So we have machines that tell us what bad content is, but then we have humans look What's at. Bad content? Um, I mean, there's a whole wide range of stuff from like bad resolution to jump cuts to um, speed and like other things that we can train algorithms on. But good content is very difficult to use computers to do it. Um, and half of the categorizer team are female and they tell me a lot of different things. Like this made me feel uncomfortable and I'm like, okay, then that should get a lower rating. And so we've actively talked about that stuff. Huh. So it's, it's all about, especially for VR and AR, like how do you feel in a headset? Like does it make someone uncomfortable? And if it makes someone uncomfortable, then like that doesn't deserve to be rated as good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what experiences you've had, not only as somebody who is a woman working in the VR field, but as someone who curates uh, 
maybe overtly o or covertly um, content. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the question exactly? I guess the, the question is to what extent have you um, and your opinions sort of influenced your environment as someone who works in VR? Um, I think... I mean, I think when I'm making VR, I, I, you have to be very intentional, and the elements that you incorporate, you want it to, I always consider, okay, what is the subtle messaging um, that's being received here, because it has a real impact on our cognition, cognition and our brain is taking that input and reading it as this is real, um, and adding that to the pattern library um, unconsciously, so that then they act on in the real world. So I think it's more like when I'm creating, I'm always, mindfully creating, um, thinking about the social impacts of the characters putting in. Um, when I'm, if I'm going to do an embodiment, what body, body should I use? Should I give an option? Mm. Um, like, and, and considering it, and especially from a, a UX standpoint, you kind of always want to consider um, the user's experience to be, I, I mean, I guess, I have like a higher, like what is the ideal world for anybody to come into if social construct didn't put anyone at a disadvantage or doesn't privilege or whatever. Um, what can, what, what would that world look like and what can I create that um, kind of strives that, that takes us there? And then at the same time, mindfully might proactively help to encourage a more um, positive or conscious social uh, perceptions or uh, in, that they can take out with them into the real world. One does of that the sense? Yeah, it does. One yeah. of the challenges from what I've heard from um, VR developers is that sometimes the tools itself that you can use to make VR programs are male coded. I heard that for a while Unity, and please fact check me on this, mm -hmm. that Unity only had the option to have kind of hairy, large hands when you look down in VR. Are, are there any sort of um, impediments like that you face designing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you well, so far, I mean, I've just started working with the OV, uh, the OVR avatars. Oculus released mm -hmm. like, uh, which is like green, like see-through hands, which are amazing. <laughs> um, nice. So, and I feel like those kind of worked really well. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's always disconcerting when I enter a game um, and the game, the the default, and that's that's the thing. It's when I see the default character, and I have to even if I even if they allow for modification, just that messaging of you're not the default. There's some games where. Uh, yeah, there's like this one robot one where it cuts off your head and you, you're entering, you're in this body, um, a female body in, on the bed and uh, he's like, uh, I forget what the name of it, ah. but anyways, he's like kind of like telling you like he basically loves humans, he loves them so much that he's going to fix them because he knows that they have problems uh. um, <laughs> and he's like about to chop your head so it's like this like suspense thing and you see your body and I was like, oh, this is not my skin color. Um, <laughs> Like, and it's like, as much as it's real, but then I've learned to see past that, and that's just something as growing up, being a minority, you, you learn to see yourself through other people's, like, you learn to overlook that, huh. but unfortunately, in the, it does, I don't think it really works the opposite way, like, I think if a white male were to put on a game and see themselves as a black woman, they might... Real, might be more of a shock. That happens. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know if you know. No. I, oh, but there, yeah. was, there was a video game recently that was released, I can't remember the name, where it actually randomized people's race and gender. Mm -hmm. And the outrage was incredible. Yeah. People were really angry. Yeah, which yeah. is like crazy to me, because like I spent my whole life seeing myself <laughs> as different people. So I've learned to be like, okay, all the physical stuff is, is, is uh, redundant doesn't really matter as long as it's the spirit or like their personality like especially when you're watching movies like I'm a huge superhero geek so I see myself in the main superheroes all the time I'm not really too worried about representation but then I realize there is a messaging that being happened that this type of person when I go into the spaces believing like I'm going to be like uh, Superman in this game or I, I'm a, I used to be obsessed with Spider-Man <laughs> um, so like like and if I'm if I'm carrying those traits or if I believe in myself to be able to do something that I feel like I mostly it's attributed to white males um, um, I'm looked at in a certain way, like, who do you, like, what are you doing? Like, this is not your area. Like, it, I get a backlash from that, which I don't feel like, um, which is, is more of an external thing. It's just a so social construct from society mm -hmm. where we believe that certain people are, are more capable uh, based on physical appearance that's fed to, through us into the yeah. media that we consume. I'm, uh, curious, yeah. about, I'm curious about capability. Yeah. So for, before I ask a question about that, Show of hands, how many of us would prefer to have a female avatar in a social VR setting, or even in an RPG set in VR? I think it depends on the experience. Okay. Um, one of the words used in this panel's description is cyberfeminism, which is a term we attribute to Donna Haraway. 
And she argues that um, technology will present so many opportunities for women to self-actualize because of how fluid um, women can be when they are embodied in technology. VR is kind of described as the apotheosis of that. So if we're going to talk about um, if we're if we're going to talk about these incredible fantasies that we might have, what are each of your fantasies for how you could be in a VR program? Yes. Who is the person you would want to be most? Ooh, that's another big question, and there's there's many ways to answer that. But I thought I'd just jump on the on the Donna Haraway thing because it's sort of central to this panel um, and. You know, I think the, the main thing there that she sort of gets at, it, it's like the classic Cartesian mind-body divide is, which we've been talking about and thinking about for so long, may be finally possible with VR because we really can be the mental side. We don't have to be female in our brains. We can be whatever we want in a mm -hmm. virtual space. The issue with this is, you know, and so one thing we had talked about earlier was like the Star Trek bridge experience. So I wanted to bring that up. I've gone in it as a man, as a woman, and had certain experiences as a woman that I didn't have in there as a man. So for a lot of a lot of the time, I'd probably rather choose a man right now, especially as relates to the capability question. And they presume you're really terrible, which you might be if you haven't done the training. But um, but I think that allowing allowing for that like full full mind body divide to happen is really exciting. The only thing that you just can't get past is voice right now. So like even when I'm in a male body, I speak as a woman, and so, you know, a couple minutes in, they're like, oh, okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so then then the, the full divide is not really there, they know who you are. So at, at a certain point, I think, maybe if voice becomes masked, then you get that full freedom, um, anonymity or whatever it might be, but right now, there's still that final limitation. Yeah, I would also be into the idea of like being an animal, and just because sometimes like I don't want to be a woman or a man, like I would love to just be, I don't know, like a cheetah or something. And <laughs> I think it would just be cool. Like in VR, you can do anything. And so, like I played Star Trek um, on Alice's account last night, and I looked down, and yeah, I had larger breasts than I'm like than normally. And I was like, this is kind of confusing because I know this isn't my body, but I also don't want to be a man. And like, why can't I just be any? Like, couldn't I just customize like whatever I want to be, and didn't have to be either? And I think there's something in that, um, which obviously there's social VR platforms that exist today where you can be an animal. And I wouldn't say that that would be like the normal of what people would want to be, but I, but I like that optionality. Um, I remember when I first tried Alt Space, and everyone was a robot. R. I. P. Yeah, RIP. Yeah. <laughs> um, and at first I was like, oh, it's so weird. Like you can't customize your avatar. You're just a robot. But it kind of made everyone the same, and and that was a nice in a way. Like so you talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I look back and I'm like, I, I kind of miss the like when everyone kind of looked the same, and it was just like about your conversation. Um, and there's something to that. And then maybe it's because like being a woman in VR, like you can get harassed, and there's like all of these things that uh, make it more difficult to go into social VR. That I'm like craving to be an animal or like um, mask my identity. Um, it's really hard to extract myself from the situation just because uh, it's like how I feel in it right now. But in the future, as Alice is saying, maybe if the voice could be masked or things like that, we wouldn't have to deal with that, but then are we just masking the problem and not really yeah, fixing it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, ideally, it shouldn't matter what you look right. like, what your voice sounds like, whatever. There shouldn't be physical, there shouldn't be um, like uh, associations with personality or capability or whatever assigned to mm -hmm. physical <laughs> um, traits. Like that's absurd. It's not rational at all. There is no basis in science or research that shows if you have darker skin, you can, you're can you more capable of doing X, Y, Z. That's not the case. It's all environmentally, we're all a social environmental factors that influence that, not physical traits. But until humanity can <laughs> wise up to that, I, I don't know. I, I think the social, con and then obviously the social contexts are, in societies are different from culture to culture. Like you might not see that, like I just actually just came from Cuba. <laughs> Um, this over this weekend and to see like I saw security guards where women were equal to men in security guards They were wearing like lacy stockings and cool. they were all required to lace the stockings But they were still treated respect like respected as equal security guards Which I was like, oh, that's so interesting to see like feminized security guards expected to be feminine, but still um, also holding that same power as the males, which is something that you would not see here. Like if you saw female security guards or police officers with lacy stockings and sand and heels, we'd immediately, immediately devalue them or devalue their uh, authority. Like, like that's just how, like that's just how our culture 
is ingrained to think, um, which is something we need to get past first. And, and right now, unfortunately, VR will only highlight the problems. Um, and until we figure out, as a humans, how we want to solve it, VR will only amplify that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. In 1995, a sociologist named Lisa Nakamura published this essay um, about how, you know Lambda Moo? Lambda Moo, no. It's just like a text-based RPG, but in Lam people were spouting all this rhetoric, you know, em embodiment digitally will be, you know, the emancipation of everybody, there will be no more race, there will be no more gender. And she saw in this RPG that so many men were um, trying to be these very sort of like kind of geisha characters, these subservient Asian women. And she was talking about how um, so long as bias exists in real life, it will exist in these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious so hard because you, you are bringing real life bias into the space of VR, but do you have any sort of empowerment fantasies for women that you would like to explore in the future? Uh, with testimony or in general? I mean, in general in VR. I mean, just to piggyback on this, because I'm not a big gamer, but I always wonder like why there is like the gender bias in a game. Like, why is there an avatar? Does it stem from like the fact that like toy stores will have like the boys' toys and the girls' toys? Like, what would happen if we'll have like a game of just everyone is a white blob? Like, <laughs> will it be less intriguing to play this game if we don't have an avatar at all and everyone is the same? Like, it's all of the most popular v VR programs right now are basically pretty gender neutral. Thumper, mm. all these puzzle games. But I think to your point, I think like the, the thing that people forget, and it's, it's, it's easy for us to talk on all these topics, but the reality is VR mimics the real world, right? And so that just, um, the technology may change, the medium may change, so, but our fundamental like human behavior, we're governed by the same human behavior, and it may be different culture to culture, but that's just going to be, as you say, maybe amplified in VR, so for me it's not about you know, I don't think we're gonna remove human nature from the virtual world. It's more about what's the proportionate control that like the trolls or the outliers will have. And you know, when we look at the internet and we think about like the comment section on the internet and like we can think about that and how that may play out in VR, mm -hmm. like what weight will that have in the virtual environment? That to me is like the, the crux of it because you know, from you know, in person to phone lines to faxes to internet, it's always been human behavior and VR is just the next step but it, it's really more about, um, you know, you're, you're going to find, I think, like you can go to, there'll be websites where the comments section are really uncivil, right? If you go to the underbelly of the internet or you go to the 4chan, whatever, there's a certain type of speech going on there and I think it's good to have free speech. I think the more freedom we have, the better. We need contrarian thinking and if you go to the FT comments section, it's gonna be like a little more civil. I think that's probably gonna be the same thing in VR. You'll find there's social spaces that are more welcoming and others that are not. Um, but it's just about the proportion, I think. I mean, something we were talking about earlier was like, is there a mute button in the social, or like should all social VR platforms have a mute button? So if someone's like really annoying you or something like that, you can mute them and maybe the avatar disappears or like what does that feel like? Like I know some companies, I forget which, have a personal space bubble. So like if somebody gets too close, then the person disappears and it's therefore- the archery can... game Quiver. Quiver. Mm -hmm. Quee VR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, that was developed because, uh, yeah, it's, um, the woman from Quiver was sexually harassed and what they realized was that they needed this like, like space block essentially. So then that way somebody couldn't like run into you and make you feel very, very awkward or like just harassed essentially. Um, and I think like to amplify on that, like that's gonna be so necessary for VR and I know that that's not like a requirement for social VR platforms, it really should be. Yeah. The, the thing that I liked especially about that tactic where they use a bubble where like if you're about to be harassed or you could see that, you can use that bubble to like send them off into space and you can't hear them and they can't see you. Like that was designed thinking like, okay, in the real world we have limitations, humans limitations. If someone's harassing me, I can't push them, I can't whatever. What could we do? VR, there are no there are no limitations. You could do anything. So they designed that in mind with like thinking if they if you could do anything, what could you do? And that still empowers the victim or whatever. At the same time, amplifies their ability to defend themselves. So that was born from that type of thinking of like in this world where there are no limitations, what is the ideal way someone can handle that situation? And I think, yeah, that's a, one of the... Or like on Reddit, the moderators, and like you can ban somebody from the subreddit. And like I think that's interesting when you think about uh, in terms of like VR spaces, like could somebody be banned for like improperly treating someone? And like does that have a negative effect on an overall score or something like that? 
And I haven't seen any of those uh, situations occur in a social VR experience, but I'm sure that uh, the people building these are looking into it because reports of harassment are definitely, like, definitely happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's a, that's a good way yeah. to think of it. Like, what if we could control that in any way, shape, or form? If we had magic slash VR, will give us that. What is a way that we would <laughs> <Yeah>. want to <laughs> shield ourselves from that or to make it stop happening? Yeah. That's yeah, and like, the challenge. I would want the person to be penalized. Like, yeah. Because if they do it to you, that means that they're doing it to other people. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, it's interesting because we're talking right now about um, escapist ex experiences that aren't, aren't really escapist at all. Right. Um, and I asked you guys about empowerment fantasies, and we turned the conversation toward kind of harassment and things like that, and ways VR can be male-coded. So is the solution to kind of helping to forge a feminist future through VR more um, viable through women actually working in VR and having these jobs and just showing up? I mean, I think going off of what Clara was saying earlier, like she's thinking about all this stuff, um, and she works in VR and is designing for VR experiences. So we need more hers out there, mm -hmm. um, because if a man is just designing the experience, maybe he's not like a man or somebody who's not uh, a minority, like is not thinking about these things. And so the more diverse your team is, the more people you, inputs you have about like how should this experience feel, because. VR is so feeling based that you need to have all these different opinions and to make sure that like what you're doing is necessarily correct but is an evolution of what's already been started and, and, and uh, will make people feel comfortable. Yeah. So, and yeah. the burden should be on men to also help correct it. Yeah. So they should do the research. <laughs> I had to research myself. And, and, and as women and as people of color, we're all still humans as well. We all have our own flawed ways of thinking. We internalize biases as well and can be the worst um, enactors of this type of harassment sometimes to each other. So research at the end of the day, both man and female, evolve, it would be beneficial in terms of if you're going to create an experience, see what the case studies are, see what type of elements are out there that help to trigger certain biases or deactivate some, some of that. Like learn about the different effects that your VR experiences can have. That's a really vital component, component to build an experience that will affect people cognitively more directly than probably TV and everything. So. And VR is like strictly tied to like Silicon Valley, Hollywood, and gaming that are all like very male centric. So the question is like, how can like women form kind of like enclosures within that to empower themselves within like every like even workplace should have like yeah. a women's group meeting and trying to kind of like solidify something. I mean, even the women in VR group, which is like super active, yeah. has 20% male in them. Uh, so I mean, I can see. Do you think that's a bad thing or a good thing? I think, yes, it will be much more comfortable to just have like a women organized centers or groups that kind of like feel free to discuss. Mm -hmm. Every I, workplace, like Upload the VR or any other place that had problems with it should have like women meetups once a month, once a week for women to just discuss and like move things forward and empower. Because when it's only women, there's more empowerment. I would add to that too. We should also create spaces where, separately from the all woman environment, where men can come in and be immersed in a more woman dominant atmosphere. They, Lord knows, they could use more of that <laughs> in Silicon yeah. Valley. Whereas that's something we're subjected to on a regular basis where we're constantly male dominated. And I think mm -hmm. that could balance out too. And at the end, end of the day, also, is that, I mean, there's no better empathy development tool than real life, right? If yep. we can create that, yeah. VR is just supposed to supplement. Um, so, or technology is just as supposed to supplement. So creating spaces where women could be dominated uh, or have owned the space and men are invited to like participate and learn and share and get a better understanding uh, also would be important to have. So while it's great that, yeah, Women in VR has been amazing for me too as a female. I feel like I can put things out there without have to, mm -hmm. having to worry about yeah, being mansplained too. Yeah, it's also like too. really well moderated <laughs> when needed. So yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, and then having a co-ed, like knowing that, you know, we're here to, this is, as a community all together, where women like let us have <laughs> the floor a bit, but you guys are invited to share and partake in our discussions, um, is also, I think, is just as important. But in the women in VR group, so when Upload was sued for sexual harassment, and then people were posting out about it in the group, weren't other like male people commenting like, 
oh, there's no way that like uh, the founders would do that. And like it was yeah. it was supposed to be a community that was like supporting women. And yeah. then here, like inside of the community that's supposed to be supporting women, then a woman who's suing uh, the founders for sexual harassment or is like being attacked. Yeah. Like I thought that that was interesting. Um, I mean, I actually, I don't have Facebook, so I can't participate in the community. But I just remember like people were sending me screenshots of like, I can't believe this is happening right now in the group. This is just like really awkward. Um, and I think that speaks to like the bigger problem of mm -hmm. like even though we are creating these groups, there's still like a societal problem, mm -hmm. um, and like we're still trying to figure out uh, how like if someone if a woman is suing somebody for sexual harassment, like not attacking the woman is like the first step. Yeah, right? <laughs> number one. And like that just happened. And like as, as a VR community, who's like everyone always talks about, we need to get more women into VR, and then this happens, and it's like then the first thing that people do is attack the woman who's suing uh, for sexual harassment. It was just like, okay, we yes, we've come a long way, and like I'm really happy to be in the VR community, but there's still a lot of issues here. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily know like what to do to address those problems. Like People wrote a lot of blog posts about it, and then they started like saying, like don't attack her. This is a problem. Um, but again, this is like translating into VR, which um, then if somebody is uh, sexually harassed inside of VR, then like, who does the woman go to? Um, if like someone in real life is saying, "Hey, I was sexually harassed," and um, she's getting back comments, mm -hmm. so it's like a, it's a it's a strange trade-off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's part of the obviously we've seen, been seeing all the headlines about Silicon Valley, and it's part of a bigger shift. But as an investor, I think like there's this ripples going through the investor community right now around harassment in Silicon Valley, and we're seeing different VC funds get shut down. And um, you know, I think there's a few more coming that are currently being investigated. And I think it, who knows, you know, if it's, if it's just a sort of few that take the fall or if it will actually trickle out. But I hope that that will have repercussions down to the companies as well, you know, and responsibility about how your CEOs and senior management are behaving. And I think investors have a responsibility to, you know, as well as users. Um, but um, so I'm hoping that something positive will come from it. So with five minutes left, um, I'm curious about, now that we've discussed how actual escapist experiences developing for VR and the culture around VR um, can be influenced by misogyny we face in real life, um, almost you know, holds barred. I'm curious, uh, let's end the conference on the note of what are ways to help forge this cyber feminist future through um, developing for VR or working in VR? Um, I mean, through this, like, I just had this idea, so maybe it's a really bad one. Be, bear with me. Um, but something that I, ha like, I try to experience a lot of different social VR, um, and I've never been in a social VR experience that was, like, specifically women, and, like, we all talked about this, and, like, we could test amongst each other, like, hey, that feel, and maybe, like, men could join as well, but it's just about, hey, let's, like, do a user session, like, in different platforms of, like, what feels good and what doesn't feel good, and, like, we can give that information back to the creators and, like, make it more of a topic, because, like, the only times that we really hear about it is, like, oh, I was harassed or, like, this, like, some this bad thing happened to me, but like, what can we do as a community to like prevent those things from happening? Um, and I, I like, I've never been a part of a social VR women group, um, but maybe that's an idea. Or mm -hmm. yeah, I will suggest that. So one of just to pump one of my companies that was up there <laughs> earlier, the Wave VR. It's an awesome experience. They have a, a party every Wednesday. I describe it very shorthand because we only got three minutes as a virtual Burning Man. It's a lot more than that. It's a, it's a performance platform, but I often am one of the only women in there. It's hard to tell because everyone's like robots or cats, but <laughs> generally, <laughs> generally. Um, and I think that's something I will suggest to them. I think that it would be worth having, like, because they can actually run simultaneous like instantiations of parties next to each other where you're not, you're in different groups um, and you don't know who the other live groups are um, in parallel. So this is something I think we could try. And we could also start rating games, too, in terms of comfort, just like how you were saying for what you guys do. And I think that's like a really great way to positively encourage and reward games that uh, make it comfortable for anybody to play and not have to worry about unwanted uh, actions or behavior. So like, like, it's, I, like my, like I, I love first person shooter games and multiplayer and <laughs> Dead and Buried is one of the ones that I really like and I'm usually also one of the only females but I've never ever felt uncomfortable and never felt worried about being uncomfortable. 
people, whereas other games like, like I was saying to you guys earlier, like Lone Echo or uh, Echo Arena, I don't know if anyone wants to play that, but like that one, you f like on a, a conscious level, you feel like you're not safe. Like you feel like you can be subjected to <laughs> unwanted event, like um, actions. Uh, really immediately, and that makes you uncomfortable while you're playing. Um, so having like a way to know that before I enter the game, like this game is perf like has been rated like really comfortable for. I think maybe yeah. it could be a notification. Like on, I'm mostly on Steam. Can you? Are you just human avatar? Or is there an option to be another avatar? For me, that would be like a good signal before mm -hmm. I went in. Could I be another avatar that's mm -hmm. not? A body. Mm -hmm. I think that would almost solve a lot. Or of a problems. genderless body. I mean, yeah. yeah, there should be more. Well, the, the intentional design decisions and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. some sort of guidelines of like yeah. have an open. But it was also to going to your point, like of the sound. Like the, you can have a genderless body, but if they can hear you and multiplayer that is interact, you're communicating. They know you're. <laughs> like that can, <laughs> that's another <laughs> giveaway. Um, yeah, but you can but like yeah. filter voice. I mean, yeah. it's everything is doable. But the question yeah. is like the design intentions that you implement on yeah. when you design a game. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And a uh, round of applause for our phenomenal panelists. Mm -hmm.